background and how you came to be speaking to us today and your level of expertise and so forth. Go ahead, Jen. It's all yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Jan Peterson, and I'm actually the Idaho Safety and Health um, Emergency Manager for BLM. And um, I've been the chair uh, for the Incident Emergency Medical Subcommittee since 2007. And my background is primarily uh, emergency medical services, three trauma centers, and then uh, came into the government uh, working full-time as a medical unit leader out of the National Interagency Fire Center. So that's pretty much where, I'm, where my background is. I'm still a card-carrying EMS um, provider, and my hope today is to give a great overview of what the IMS is working on, some of the issues that we've got, and then of course field any questions at the end of the presentation. So whenever you're ready, I can take it away. Okay, do you want me just to go ahead and begin? I'll go ahead and begin. <laughs> All right, um, this is basically an update. I've had the privilege to speak to this a bunch before, and um, it really helps to get this information out that we're working on, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. Okay, so basically our mission has been and, and is to this day that we're trying to uh, basically look at all the you know the needs that surround the everyday mission for emergency medical and occupational health care needs of <clears throat> managed incidents and then making sure that it's an integration of the local state and tribe and federal systems and you know it, it's very interesting when you get into the real aspects of emergency medical services nationwide it varies so much from state to state, agency to agency. So it's been really um, a challenge that I think that the IMS, you know, we've been taking one bite of the elephant at a time. So uh, I think that there's uh, a lot that we've got going on, and hopefully this presentation will display that. So our core members are myself, of course, and John Thomas, who is our executive secretary. And then our medical advisor is Dr. Jim Upchurch, and he's actually a federal physician, um, and he has been an advisor from the get-go. Then we've got Mary Jo Lohman, who's from the Region 1 Incident Management Specialist Program, and then David Beer uh, with the Forest Service as well. And then we have Mark Knott, that is with the Park Service uh, out at Lake Mead. And then we've got a represent, representative from the uh, state EMS entity, Wayne Denny. And then National Association of State EMS Officials is Rachel Alter. And we'll get into some of those efforts that are going on at that level as well. And then we've got Larry Grubbs, who is our National Association of State Foresters. And then, of course, our um, liaison has been Larry Sutton from the get-go. One of the things that we've done differently uh, within the last year is that we decided that we needed some boots on the ground, input, expertise, uh, and from their eye set, and you know, just basically accumulating information what would really help and benefit EMS operations on the ground. So we've got Alex Albels, who's with the Great Basin Smoke Jumpers. He's our smoke jumper rep. Then we've got Debbie Anderson, who is the Region 6 uh, Incident Management Specialist Program Lead. And then we've got, she's with the Forest Service, we've got TJ Golson, who is our hotshot representative, and he's with the Idaho, C Idaho City Hotshots. We've got Bruce Hicks, that's... Um, on the structure side of the house, he's a paramedic and medical unit leader. We've got Steve Autopolic and Jim Powell, who are both medical unit leaders, paramedics with the Region 6 program. Then we've got uh, Rodney Schmidt, who is from R1, uh, medical unit leader, paramedic. 
And then we have Tavis Sorensen, who is our engine representative and very active in the EMS realm. And then our newest addition is Eric Graff, who is with the Grand Canyon uh, Park Service, and he has a, a big background uh, with uh, medevacs and helicopter operations and stuff like that. So we've really rounded out uh, getting some of the expertise that we need. So my hope today, like I said earlier, is to provide an overview uh, and if nothing else, uh, you know, relay some of the things that we're working on. One of the current uh, projects, or, or not really issue, but a project uh, is the new ICS-206 medical plan and it actually was a combined effort with the Lessons Learned Center, uh, Alex down there, and we had some great input for those folks. They actually uh, put it together and then worked with the IEMS. And uh, I think that one of the things that is really important about this form is that um, you become very familiar with it. Use it as a tool. And I know that uh, some of the teams have different versions of the plan. Um, but what, what our hope was, was to provide something that could standardize because we've got medical people that may go on one fire and they may have, that team has a plan, and then they go to the next fire and it may be a different looking plan. So the hope was to provide a tool and uh, a, a good form that could stimulate those those important key things that need to take place when there's any kind of medical operation or medical mission uh, within an incident. So it, um, you know, become familiar with the form, but I think the main thing that we are really, really interested in is, is the fact that you practice the form. So practicing the form means that you actually simulate, maybe do tabletops, uh, get with your shot crews, uh, helitack, helibase, and really, really know how to implement a critical incident medical plan where it's an incident within an incident and everybody knows what their their jobs are and I think the big thing is to simulate those communication skills, skills from the bottom up and from the, the top down where everyone understands what it is that needs to happen. And then also the other important aspect uh, of this whole thing is being able to to actually have it use it as an assessment in a, in a way uh, are we putting people in where it would be hard to get them out these are all considerations that should be adapted or are considered during your tactical meetings whatever and you know make sure that there is a way of getting people out if there isn't do they need to be there so that's been a um, a big program that um, and working with the Lessons Learned Center was, is really very advantageous. So the other thing that we're really trying to stimulate is for logistics, safety, whoever, whoever super actually supervises that medical unit, MEDL, is to know what you are ordering. And, you know, there's a lot of anachronisms now. Um, you know, we look at the qualification guidelines and if we go all the way down to uh, the support section and let me see if I can grab it here which is about 76 I'd like to give just a um, you know here's your support section but there have been some changes and when we start talking and I'll, I'll give an example here of the advanced emergency medical technician fire line We've, we've actually put together um, the position description, it, I guess is really what it is, for line positions when it comes to EMT line, advanced EMT, paramedic, uh, you know, those type of position levels where they are fire line. So the other thing is that <clears throat> beings that they are fire line, they have additional training and skills that 
that are required now uh, on top of the arduous level as well. Well, one of the other things that's happened is that um, there used to be um, EMT, intermediate, advanced EMT. What we did was we clumped it all together because they're, the skill sets are very similar. And the only requirement is, is that they take the um, 200, ICS 200 for all hazards. And I think that that's an important thing to understand is that find out in what state that you're in, what do those skill sets look like. So um, what happened was uh, the FEMA side of the house decided to take the acronym advanced EMT, which is fine. And but it, what it did was it bumped the skill set up for the regular uh, advanced EMT to have that all hazard class. So it's not that, you know, it's online, it's not that difficult. And I think that it's something that can definitely uh, benefit and it gets a lot of the confusion. Okay, we've got a couple of things going now that um, I think it's very relevant to to show, and one of them is uh, our Facebook or our uh, website. It will be going under construction because of the new standards that are that are going to be happening for the internet. And so, uh, you know, we we try to keep this website uh, pretty active, and you know, for resources and stuff. And um, it's pretty much outdated, uh, or updated, excuse me, uh, so that it doesn't get up outdated. And I think that uh, it's very important to have this as a resource. And hopefully, you're on an incident that does have uh, internet capabilities. But the other thing that's new, and this is my first attempt at a, a Facebook page, is <clears throat> we do have a Facebook page now. And this is it. Uh, we've got quite a few. We've got people that are, uh, it's great because we've got people from Israel to, there's a lot of communication going on. Um, we talked about short haul, um, you know, the Wolf Star, uh, the latest from Lessons Learned. We refer, refer to them a lot. And, and then here, uh, like for an example, when I, the new transition from EMT Intermediate uh, to advanced EMT and this guides them to where they can get that information as to exactly what happened and the transition plan. So if you have any questions on it you can uh, go this route. So again you know it's, it's just uh, another way to get information out uh, when it talks to licensure and when it talks about uh, you know some of the rabdo things, um, what do healthcare providers need to know, and then of course um, short haul and then resource lists. So this is kind of uh, and then the big one is the interstate compacts and and EMS crossing state lines, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, anyway, so it, it's our hope to get that information out and uh, it really has uh, opened up a lot of discussion. So, all right, moving on. So let's talk about that interstate compact. Um, and basically what it is, is the National Association of, of State EMS Officials, which is basically comprised of uh, each state has a EMS director, and the EMS director, uh, that body, that accumulative body of folks, um, serves to form as the NSEMSO. And here is, uh, this actually started about three years ago, and Department of Homeland Security put together the National Advisory Council. Uh, the Forest Service and BLM were represented by Larry Sutton and myself, and we sat around the table and talked about some of the issues of going across state lines and the liabilities associated with it, only to find out that it's not just um, wildland fire, it's border patrol. 
it is the um, air air you know air marshals and back on the east coast one city may have several boundaries state boundaries uh, lines right within the city so it's a huge issue for everyone so what they did was they decided all right we need to uh, come up with a way to travel between states and be able to practice medicine so we looked very basically at the driver's license which does a lot of the same things so what they did was they put together a, a group that actually outlined um, outlined the verbiage that could be sent to the states to actually have the states adopt it and that the hope is that the states will adopt it and then uh, what will happen is that that ability to be able to cross state lines so that will be a huge help for EMS uh, within wildland fire incidents however basic life support there isn't as much of a problem as when you start dealing with uh, advanced life support licensure like advanced EMTs or paramedics or higher you know it um, you know that that can be a real issue and so the rule of thumb for basic life support is practice within your scope and make sure that you are doing those things that you are actually licensed for and are certified for so that's a a, a huge issue that is gaining momentum probably in several sectors not just uh, BLM and the Forest Service and the uh, Department of Interior but uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of national efforts going on right now for BLM and for the Forest Service because it's a very, very complex, multifaceted, um, I don't want to say problem, but it, it is very challenging because each state, we did actually a state survey, uh, NISEMSO put together a survey for each state to say, well, what about these folks coming in and putting up medical units and being able to take care of our own basically is all we really want. We're not responding or a 911 agency, we're just trying to take care of our own. And it was amazing to those EMS directors in each state as to what their state did allow or not allow. The only state that really said go for it is Utah, which I really wish the rest of the states would adopt. but. Um, you know, it, it was a very interesting revelation to all when we found out that, you know, there are some very sticky areas with this. So um, this whole effort was put together and, you know, we've got, uh, you know, some compact conditions, uh, what would that look like, and then also having the National Registry as a baseline for if they've got that certificate for training because National Registry is not a licensure it is just a certificate for training but at least there'd be a standard for all the different levels and it did meet the national scope of um, national scope of for EMS which is the EMT advanced EMT and then paramedic and the one that has not been adopted yet and there's been a lot of discussion is the emergency medical responder if you remember that used to be the first responder level so um, there is a place for that and actually um, NISEMSO is hoping that that will be um, added to IQS, IQCS and become a physician as well because they could certainly um, you know the e EMRs now that level actually does quite a few of the same things that the EMTs can do so that's another whole sidebar that uh, we'll be dealing with as we go along. So one of the things that we decided was really, really important was to have some form of communication. So we've really done a, a lot of focus on, on getting information out, getting the news out. And, you know, so we thought, all right, let's start a newsletter. And the decision was made at our last um, our last face-to-face -face, uh, IMS meeting that we'll do it 
one in the summer fall and then um, you know we'll do we'll do one in the fall and then one in the spring and cover issues that that medical units are dealing with and get information this one actually was a uh, effort with the uh, CDC and the Public Health Service worked with us on this and dealing with Camp Crud you know what are you seeing those types of things and trying to get some type of um, information and data which is really important so uh, we'll be coming out with one uh, right before fire season and hopefully uh, it's on our web page and it'll be on our web page and it will be of course on our website and uh, Facebook page so let's talk about um, the awards program this actually is now in its second year and um, the awards program has really gained momentum and we've got a very talented uh, group of folks that make the awards committee and they've got a chair for it and of course our uh, federal representative is uh, Jean Madden and there's quite a few other folks on there and what they do is um, just for an example, uh, for the 2014 Wild on Fire uh, Emergency Medical Services Award nominations, we had several categories. Um, Outstanding Wildland Fire EMS Individual of the Year Award, um, Outstanding Wildfire EMS Squad Crew or Team Award, and then Outstanding um, Wildfire Distinguished Service, and then Award of Excellence for while, uh, wildfire EMS rescue and then lifetime achievement in wildland fire and it's been interesting it's gaining momentum we're starting to get folks that that are um, filling out the nomination and then it's sent into Hope Springs there at the fire center and um, she then gets that to the awards nomination committee and uh, they go through it this year we'll be having uh, media uh, about the four awards that are that are being given, and uh, I'm not allowed to give the names yet, but there's some really good things that are happening, and so I think that um, you know if you if you're on a fire and you've got something that happens really well done, let's get some good press. It's not just the bad stuff. We're trying to promote some of the very good stuff that is happening out there on the grounds when it comes to EMS. Uh, missions and operations so um, logistics chief safety officers whoever anyone can nominate and uh, and then you know get that out so that people are aware of what it is that we're doing okay um, the other things some of the other projects that we've come about um, that have come up is We've made some checklists, and we'll be getting that out uh, probably on our Facebook page and on the website. But uh, we put together, you know, we we didn't really find uh, any type of uh, medical units, MEDL unit evaluations. So what we did was we put together two products that uh, one is for line managers, and it would be a, a good example of that. It's, let's say that we've got a large incident or type 1, 2, or 3 incident on a district or on a forest, and that tool would, you know, be something that the line manager can, you know, maybe visit the medical unit or visit the um, IMT and say, hey, you know, these are some some considerations. So it's actually an aid to have them look at what's happening in their area of responsibility for medical operations. So the other thing too is that um, the review teams for like uh, fire and aviation safety team reviews that hop around in, within geographical areas so we made a list for them as well so that it doesn't really take somebody with a medical background any of the team members can do a good evaluation of the medical unit so those are a couple of uh, items that will be uh, sent out and dispersed and hopefully uh, a useful tool the other thing that um, 
actually John Thomas, who's on the call taking notes for any questions or whatever, um, he, the, all the IMS decided, you know, we really need a email group to be able to get this information out to folks. So we've really made a uh, really concerted effort of trying to get all the names for type one crew, uh, type one IMTs, type two IMTs, um, and people that go out as MEDLs or maybe as line EMS, and get them on an email group so that uh, we can, if there's a real issue or an update or a safety alert we can get that out to them as fast as possible and it's been a real ongoing task um, that I think that we're getting to the point now that we'll be having that we're having our face-to-face -face meeting the week of April 27th here in Boise and we'll be uh, putting together uh, some releases so to speak for that email group and hopefully uh, we'll keep it updated and that way they also have a place where they can uh, fire back a question if they've got it. So um, that's that whole thing is a, a good effort. And then regional efforts. Um, Region 3, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the incident medical specialist but uh, the forerunner, the, the, the real programs are in Region 1 and Region 6 and it's interagency and they specifically have medical unit training and they have um, you know it's a, a very uh, processed very great way to have well I, I guess I want to say professional um, IMS or medical units on on incidents so it's really a good thing there's several several regions that are very interested in it and um, we're hoping that that it takes off because it again it just puts that professional uh, layer and level that um, is so important so that you you know we've got some really standardized uh, stuff happening in medical units. The other thing that's on the horizon um, is that the medical unit leader course is going to be revised. Uh, FEMA does have the has has the reins to uh, a lot of that uh, revision. However, uh, the training unit there at the fire center is hope they have let them know that uh, IMS is very willing to partner so that we make sure that the the course addresses wildland fire issues. So um, that's that's a very key thing because there's a lot of urban stuff and whatever with FEMA, but I think that we are very interested in keeping uh, a real good focus on the wildland fire aspects of uh, the medical unit leader course. Um, the other thing that we've really kind of uh, talked about is developing uh, through the email group list, uh, developing a medical unit leader national association again to get that information out. Uh, the other thing that we have waiting in the wings is we'll be doing a survey monkey uh, we're testing it, we're doing a, a, a pilot test uh, probably w within this month and having some medical types try it out. But it's trying to find out some of the issues that are on the ground. What are some of the things that the EMS people are, are uh, seeing and using? So um, that there's some real hopes for that. On the horizon, uh, one of the things that the face-to-face -face meeting will be doing uh, this time is to we've got the clinical treatment uh, for wildland fire which uh, hopefully some of you are familiar with this it's our first published document and what it is is uh, uh, for those things that aren't taught in necessarily an EMT class and so it has uh, it's a being able to triage figure out for like dental, whether it's a urgent or semi-urgent or routine that can be handled, and the whole document has those things that are commonly seen uh, on, on in medical units. So this next huge piece will be to develop the training that's associated with the these guidelines, so that 
um, you know, regions, whether it's a region, there's some great training efforts going on. Uh, I know down in Arizona they've got some good stuff happening with Sedona Fire Department. There's some other, uh, probably about five others that are really aggressive good stuff. So our hope is to give them a template for training, um, dealing with the clinical nature of stuff. And um, so that's on the horizon. That's what we're working on. And then that's pretty much what I've got. And uh, here's my contact information. And don't hesitate to contact me. And I'd like to open it up for any questions. Hey, Jan. This is uh, Gary Stewart. Um, I'm the communications duty officer over the fire center. Can you go back to that uh, form that you had for the teams? Uh, when you first started your presentation, I've got a question about the, the air frequencies that you have in there. Is there a place for those to contact uh, any kind of air ambulances that are coming in? Okay, are you talking about the 206 form? Yes. Okay, stand by. I, I'm really okay. happy to see something standardized with that. Um, it was a little hard for me to read on the screen here, so I really couldn't uh, couldn't play with it and see it until I figured out how to zoom in on it. Um, well, um, one of the things that can happen, you know, there's there's uh, and uh, Mark Jones, are you on by any chance? I don't think he was. Let me look at the attendees. Okay, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of work that's being done right now with air frequencies, and we're hoping that at our our face-to-face uh, -face meeting in April, that'll be right here in Boise, that we'll we'll be able to find out some stuff about that. Um, you know, there is uh, up at the top, we've got the EMS frequency and stuff. Uh, the big thing that I I guess I'd like to ask of you. Uh, when we, you know, on the, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there is, um, there is room for, you know, there is some uh, frequency delegation that shows up on there for air and ground. Um, and that's the other thing, too, that that's one of the things that is really uh, being worked on as we speak. So have a look at the form, either from our web page or our Facebook page, either one, and um, or this presentation, um, I can make it available for whoever as well. But have a look at it, and that kind of feedback is going to be very important. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of talk on that, and, and uh, we're trying to figure out how we can use uh, the the B fire uh, frequencies for for some of this because a lot of the helicopters that medical facilities have to have uh, that frequency in there. So I'm, I'm glad to see this. Uh, uh, I just had a question. Thank you. And I believe uh, Jim Newman had his hand up, and I accidentally uh, put his hand down for him. But go ahead, Jim Newman. Did you have a question? Uh, just a comment, Martin. Are you there? Go ahead, loud and clear. OK. Um, just like the last comment was that, I saw this form uh, for the first time at the uh, ACIC meeting last week in Phoenix, and uh, I Googled it right away uh, and found it. And I just, I just think this form is, is, is uh, it's very timely, and we've needed it for years. And I, I really support the effort of this form, and uh, especially if we can take it to all risk um, as we teach courses uh, out in the FEMA world and such. That was my only comment. I think this is a great form. All right. That's that's good feedback, and I will make sure we have um, IMS conference calls every two weeks. So I'll I'll make sure that gets back to them. And oftentimes we invite Alex and uh, lessons learned folks on our calls um, to actually find out from them some of the trend analysis, what's going on accident wise or whatever. And it's been a very uh, very good uh, partnership with them. Yeah, and do you know if they if they have out the this is the WF version wildfire? Um, is FEMA looking at taking this to an all risk uh, in their world? Have we heard? 
You know, I have not heard, but I certainly can. Uh, I know John's probably writing this down. We can certainly talk to Tony Doty. Um, I would imagine would be the first first place to to ask that question, and I have no problem. Um, you can email me, and I will try and find out where that's at for FEMA. Copy that. Thank you. You better bet. ask him. Better ask him before the first of May. I think he's leaving pretty soon. <laughs> oh, he is a short timer. All right. Okay, I will do that. There was another question. Go ahead. Was that Rich or who's that? Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Okay. Okay. Uh, from what I understand, what you're saying, the reciprocity issue hasn't been resolved yet. Is that correct? Um. Resolved, no. Being addressed, yes. So um, I think that that is really important to know that that effort is going on in the background uh, with NASEMSO. <clears throat> and, um, but the beauty of it is, is that they actually, I kind of scratched my head when this all began, but they really did come up with everything within their two-year time frame commitment and I know that several states uh, will be looking at adopting that. Uh, what states there are exactly, I'm not sure, but most of the states when they had their uh, national meeting of EMS directors, um, they were very supportive of, of this whole thing because it's an issue, like I said, not just with fire, but it's with uh, everyday agencies and, and other federal agencies. So, yes, it's in the process. Okay, so when, when we have people coming from outside of the state to the incident, we still have to get the okay from the state EMS director? Yes, the limited recognition form. Um, and I, I think it's more of a courtesy, a courtesy notification letting him know that we've got so-and-so from Texas in Idaho or we've got so-and-so from wherever, uh, letting him know that we've got an incident. We've actually had some some fires that have had uh, state EMS officials show up at the fire just to get educated for what it is we're doing. And I think the big thing is showing him that we're really just trying to take care of our own people. We're not responding. To 911 and putting mom and pop uh, ambulances out, uh, you know, out of work. So uh, there's been a two-way, a really, uh, really good effort for that two-way communication when it comes to all of this. Hi, uh, um, Jan. There, this is Josh McDaniel. There's there are a few uh, questions that have come in written. Um, I can read okay. them out if you like, or if you if you can pull them up there. But also, when uh, the questions come in, if you could repeat them. So a lot of people are having trouble hearing some of the folks that are talking a uh, long ways away from mics and that sort of thing. All right. Do you see those questions that are written there? Uh, no. Here, I'll read them out to you. Okay. So the first one's from That's Steve Horton. And he says, has this committee taken a comprehensive look at the metal kits that are built in Missoula for use by the national caches to see if they contain the right products for use by IMTs? Okay, um, since you're reading it, I'm not going to say it again, but um, there's been a lot of work, and fortunately, uh, one of our core members who is uh, MJ uh, Lohman, she is actually the program lead, and she works right there with the Missoula Cash. There are several efforts going on right now. One of them is the FAST kit that um, Alex Obels and some of the folks there at the Fire Center Equipment Development folks are working on. That's uh, BLM, but it has been trial run and tested by several uh, agencies, and there's a lot of work do being done towards that. There's also um, an, another kit that's it's kind of a, a firefighter, lifesaver kit, whatever. It's those things that would be needed for uh, severe trauma, like stop the bleeding, um, airway uh, management, and those types of things, all in a small um, five by three kit. And so there are some efforts and some things that they're looking at for what's needed on the ground. 
for whether it's a, a line EMS um, mission or whether it's a medical unit, uh, there is quite a bit of work that's going on right now. And um, hopefully if you kind of stay up with our Facebook page and our web page, uh, we'll be having some information on that. So, great answer. How about, uh, if you don't mind me interceding, also there's some hands up. How about we call on Rich DeRazio. His has been up for a while. And Rich, you need to unself mute yourself so she can hear your question. Uh, Rich is yeah. having trouble unmuting, so he's written this question in. And oh, he did. I, Go ahead with I, that. I got one. it. I figured it out. Okay. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. This is Rich DeRazio. Go I ahead. Got my mute problem. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the IMS position will become any plans to make it available on Ross. It is available in Ross, as far as I'm uh, that I know of. What's the what's the uh, ordering code? I don't have that in front of me, but I could certainly get that for you. Is it in three? I couldn't find it in three ten. That's what I was kind of going by, unless I just missed it. Okay, I can get that information for you. Okay, thank you. You bet. Um, just email me, and that would be probably the best thing. And we also have um, on our website and on our Facebook page, you know that pretty much that contact number is for John Thomas and myself so fire that question away and we'll get the answer for you okay thank you you bet and how about we go with uh, Dan Willis has his question his hand Dan Wills or did he do a written one Josh no nope, just a hand up Dan go ahead you're unmuted ready to talk Dan Wills You had your hand up, Dan. Did you have a question? You're unmuted. You're ready to go. Okay. What Dan, about uh, probably audio? Just type it in. Okay. What about John Thomas? He's got his hand up, did, but you're muted, John. Did you want to add something to what Jan was saying? John, go ahead and speak. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, I'm yep. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, I just follow up questions for people. Um, under uh, the uh, medical uh, plan, the uh, 206, yes, there is an all risk. It's listed underneath the NWCG's webpage under their publications, and you'll see both the uh, uh, 206 WF while on fire and this a plane of 206. On the 100 and 500 man person first aid kits, they do go on. They are a U.S. Forest Service product, and they do an ongoing evaluation within Region One, where the IMS uh, management personnel and uh, MJ Loman, like uh, Jan talked about, um, there has been talk about a national contract, and those that are interested might uh, uh, key into Shane Lavalley's uh, talk on the Viper contracts uh, Thursday afternoon for more information or to find out the current. On, on the IMS, uh, Incident Medical Specialist, uh, there is acronyms for those. Uh, there's three of them. Uh, IMST for a technician, IMSA for the assistant manager, and IMSM for manager. Um, I believe they might be listed under the technical specialist uh, categories. Uh, that's all I had for follow up. Thank you, John. That helps a lot. Okay, next question. There's a written question from Tom Johnston, and Tom asks, where in the medical plan do we add the Dutch Creek protocols? Okay, let me get in front of that. I think I'll go to this one. Um, basically, what it is is the protocols are, or for back, lack of a better word, the nine line is after, um, and, and here's the directions for it. But this is the one through nine um, complete items. You know, it talks about the status, the patient assessment, and then severity, transportation plan, and all those things. So when we go back to this and look at the plan. 
it is on this part. So this is basically uh, what that has evolved into. So, and that may that meets uh, the Dutch Creek protocols as well. Any comments or questions on that? Okay. Dan Wills has wrote in, written in. He says, if you have input into the 206 revisions, can you ensure that frequency information blocks have all the same criteria as listed on the 205, i.e. tones, channel names, DE, et cetera? Yeah. Um, again, like I said, this was a combined effort uh, was not just the IEMS and I think that as um, some of those radio frequency issues uh, are dealt with that you'll be seeing some new uh, addendums or whatever uh, that will be coming out to address that on the plans. Okay, next question. That's all Did the you have any more, Josh? That's all ones? the good ones. Okay. All right. Um, are there any other hands up or anything that we need to answer questions for? Well, I just want to let you know my hand is up giving you the high five. That was a good presentation. And, uh, I think, <laughs> Thank I think you. It was pretty smooth to go from one webinar to another. That was quite the uh, experiment. <laughs> well, I hope that if nothing else, uh, it'll stimulate some conversations uh, with the, the IMTs. And, you know, it's a, it's a, a a work in motion in a lot of ways and I think that you know there's not going to be a, that's one of the hard things about this whole scenario this whole um, EMS is that it just varies like I said so many different facets and I think that um, if you've got questions or there's uh, stuff that you'd like to see us maybe address uh, more or even asking us if it's even being looked at. There's a lot of behind the, uh, behind the scenes stuff that is happening right now, and you know it's a huge effort. And so many times, this poor little IEMS has kind of stood, feeling like uh, they're in front of a tsunami with a you know a inner tube and a paddle. And um, so we're trying, and the, the team, you know, the subcommittee is a very uh, there's a lot of synergy and there's a lot of uh, just deep-seated caring about the everyday POGA on the ground. So um, we do 120 percent and uh, we can always use some input and if you have questions contact us. There's a, another hand raised from Greg Bergen. Greg, do you have a question? Yeah, actually I did. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, you know, I, I'm just on the, uh, the SEMSO site right now, and it shows the last update for the uh, state process for legal recognition being July of 2012. Is this a antiquated site? Is there a, a more recent site that can give more current information, or is that actually the last uh, updated uh, list of uh, the processes? That's the same process, um, and you know, it, it hasn't really been updated, uh, changed because of the anticipation of being able to have the interstate compact. So it was just basically a band-aid and the true hope is that we'll have the interstate compact and uh, a lot like what the nursing is, nurses have. Um, so there's a lot of work still being done. But yes, that's the, the latest Perfect. form. Perfect, thanks. Uh, good webinar too. Anything else? Well, Jan Peterson and uh, John Thomas, uh, thanks to both of you. That was a very well done presentation. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. 
And uh, John, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so Josh McDaniel, before I close this one out, should I just go ahead and shut down this webinar? Because that was the only one hour session for that. And then we'll all join back to the other one after lunch. Correct. Yep. And what time does that start back at? Uh, 1300 Pacific time. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, would, you, would you like me to send this uh, presentation to someone? Yes. Would you send it to Martin Miracle, please? I sure and, will. And I think you have my email address, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh. Uh, thanks a lot. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you. All right. We'll keep the VTC thing going, though, everybody. <laughs>